<laughs> I hear you. I hear you. That's a situation I'll deal with after the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> You ever like walk into a situation like, oh yeah, let's do this media, but in the back of your head, you're like, fuck, I gotta argue. I, I remember one year, fuck, it had to be like 05. But it was the year before the big flood in Cedar Rapids, and I was playing penguins. That's how I remember all of my comedy dates based yeah. on natural disasters that eventually destroyed those clubs. <laughs> <laughs> It was the year before Cedar Rapids got flooded in the big Mississippi River flood in the early aughts. And I rem- I was in a fucking shouting match with this girl I was dating at the time. Yeah. As I'm walking to the stage, like, uh-huh. I'm in the showroom. Like, it's full blown. A motherfucker, you don't fucking <laughs> listen to me. Give it up for Roy Wood as he makes his way to the stage. <laughs> like, as, I, as my first foot hits the first step, to get on stage, that's when I hit in call. Oh, oh my god! Hey, how y'all doing tonight, Cedar Rapids? What's going? On? Oh, <laughs> like an angry father trying to, like you're in a shouting match with your wife, and then you turn to your kids. Hey, but <laughs> what's going on? I see that with uh, I shouldn't say the name, but some big comedian. Like I'm hosting, he's dropping in, and I'm like, "How do you want to introduce me?" He's like, "Whatever you want." And I go on stage, give it up. And he's like, hey, everybody, how are you? And I'm like, liar. That's Dude. not who I saw. There was, fuck. And I, and I try to get intros right. And I was drunk. There's, there's one or two that I wish I could have back. Um, fucking Joel McHale. Mm. The honorable, respectable Joel McHale. It's probably like my first year in LA. And I can't remember what I said. I either introduced him as as Greg Kinnear or Chris Hardwick. I can't remember. But either way. Oh, wow. That's <laughs> a either way, I did not say Joel McHale. Like I wasn't even like just freestyle. Like you were given permission to just freestyle, but just for no matter what, get the name right. Yeah. And I was fucking way off. I was fucking Russian missiles landing in Poland. Did he? <laughs> what was his reaction off. to that? Was there? Oh, he just walked past me, no handshake. Like it was like get the fuck off the stage, mm-hmm. bro. Like he wasn't a dick about it, but he could have been way meaner about yeah. it. But he was just like, you don't get the handshake. If you get the name wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The handshake is the reward from the headliner. And there you go. I will touch you and make people think we are friends backstage. And he didn't give me that at all. I had, I used to host a lot. And, you know, they wouldn't have the lineup. It was, it was an unpaid show at the, the, the comedy shop, The Lantern. Mm-hmm. And I was on stage. I always tell them, because I'm terrible with names. I'm terrible with names. And I say, please, I have to know the lineup. And so... I mean, this is bad. And I'm hosting, and it's one of those, I don't know who it is. Then in the back, they point to the guy. Oh. He's going next. And it's <laughs> it's two. I, I, I met him. He's Indian, and I met another Indian comic at the same time. I met them both. Ay, ay, ay. I remembered. I knew. I knew one of their names. It wasn't the one who was there. For some reason, my brain freaks out. I know it's not mm-hmm. the other Indian man I met. <laughs> no. I know this. I didn't mix them up. I literally just said the other person's, I don't know what happened. I short-circuited. And I, you know, I apologize every time I see him. He (laughs) remembers. Because he remembers. He remembers. I didn't even mix them up. I just truly, I didn't know what to say. Yeah. One time at UCB, didn't remember the sketch team name, so I said, Everyone, oh my God. make some noise! They go crazy. By the way, Give it, it, was, it was the... Ah! It was, <laughs> and I ran off stage. By the way, it was, he was introducing my sketch team. So as a good friend, you had no idea. You, and you had actually, you had one job Beautiful. to do that night. Barely any stand-up. Beautiful. You just had to introduce. It was really a fail. But that's why I would never... I don't have any pride about someone fucking up my name. Someone fucks up my name... I'll go up there and I'll correct it. My name is Joe Marco Cerezi. It's long. I don't. I. I don't know. I don't like. I'm Ron Wood, Roy Woods, Ron Woods Jr., Roy Jones Jr. Just go up there and be funny. No one gives a fuck. Yeah. Like it's not. I remember on the road when I first started, knowing what I know now. 
these guys were being a little dickish, but I would open for headliners. My, my first nine years of stand-up was just the South and the Midwest. I didn't fuck with the coast. Like, unless it was an audition or some TV shit or whatever, but, like, bread and butter was five nights a week, four cities and five nights. So you open for a lot of weirdos and a lot of guys that are on the other side of their career, and their last bit of respect is bullying you. Mm -hmm. Like, it's the only power they have left in life. And these motherfuckers, bro, some of them will give you an intro card that has say it exactly like this read this line pause then say this line and the card is tattered and brown and it's just from hand every hand that's ever touched it is it's the same card you have to give it back at the end of the night and then he gives it back to you the next night instead of just making multiples of these to give to comedians every week if your intro is that fucking important to you but like these guys would just fucking read every credit don't skip over anything don't whatever yeah. Yeah. And that just stuck with me. Like, it's on some PTSD abuse shit where just now anyone that I'm bringing up, hey, what do you want me to say? And then I will go in a corner and attempt to commit it to memory so it feels natural. And then if I can't, I pull out my fucking phone and I'll just read your shit like it's 1998 in Tallahassee, bro, because I don't want no fucking trouble with you in the green room. Because yeah. I stumbled over some shit. These credits get old. Sometimes you're like, it's the, the Tonight Show uh, before Johnny Carson. Whoever hosted that one. That's yeah, the but they want you to say it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, there was a guy. I can say his name because he's passed and I'm not speaking ill of him. Oh, wait. No, it wasn't him. <laughs> <laughs> this dude's still alive. That's Kippadada. Kippadada was mad at me one time. R.I.P. Kippadada. Kipadada got mad because like I I didn't get his intro wrong. I was opening for Kipadada, who's like one of those Carson legend era yeah. like Leno open for him type shit. Uh -huh. Like he's OG OG vet. And I opened for I don't fucking know him because I didn't watch TV when he was popping. You know? Yeah. And I don't say that disrespectfully. I'm right. just saying your stretch where you, when you were in your prime, I was still watching Transformers. Yeah. So you're just another headliner whose intro I will get proper and will show you respect and read your shit the way you want me to fucking read your shit. But before I brought him up, it was the night that Michael Vick, I was opening for him in Atlanta at the punchline, and it was the night that Michael Vick and the Falcons beat the Packers on the road in Lambeau in the playoffs, which had never happened before in history. Mm -hmm. The Packers don't lose at Lambeau in the mm -hmm. playoffs. And the Falcons went up there and punched them motherfuckers in the mouth. So before I brought up Kip Adada, I announced the final score of the game. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, before I bring your headliner up, this just seeing Michael Vick and the Falcons have defeated the... Uh -huh. <sighs> motherfuckers are fucking patting in it. Fucking chaos. <laughs> Give it up for Kipadada. And he was fuming. Ooh, that motherfucker was mad with me. <laughs> <laughs> like, if it was Sunday, so it was the last night of the week, he would have fucking fired me. He was going to for sure fire me. Yeah. But it was Sunday, and he couldn't. <laughs> so you fucking last night, I made it, motherfucker. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, I get it now. You throw off the energy of the room, you create a pep rally, and then you bring up a headliner whose style doesn't necessarily play into that, then you're setting them up in the wrong place, you know? Yeah. Like the I, role of an MC. Stand, I was at Stand Up New York, and right, I was closing it, and the, the host brought up an audience member onto the stage to teach her how to twerk. And I said, oh, fuck me, dude. Jeez, is that fuck. A and they had, they had to escort her off the stage. She didn't want to leave. Once they get a taste of that stage. <laughs> And they're twerking too. I, it goes wrong sixty to seventy percent of the time when you bring an audience member on stage. Yeah, outside of a hypnosis show, maybe. Like I don't really know when you need that. Like I guess the magicians, but just a regular comedian bringing just gin pop yeah. up. The fuck for. Yeah, I, I won't say his name, but there mm -hmm. was a comedian um, at a college conference. 
And you know, speaking of following chaos, yeah, there was a college conference for the listeners. Comedians like to get booked at colleges. You perform at these big fucking NFL combines where there's like three, two hundred, three hundred schools, and like you know, a handful of rep reps for each school. And if they like you, they bring you to their school the next school year. And there was a comedian. It was the year of Soldier Boy and cranked that Soldier Boy dance mm-hmm. or whatever. And so, if you're a college comic, you know it's it's easy. You can have material, and this guy's a he's a comedian that's respected in the game, so he has material. But it's a college show. Like it, who wants to come up here and do the Soldier Boy? <laughs> come on up here. And the joke is basically white people can't dance. Like that's essentially the game. Yeah. yeah. Just bring white people up here and ask them to do current dances, and then we all laugh at you, and you get attention that you didn't get at home, and everybody feels entertained. <laughs> and that, yeah. and you'll book an extra ten to fifteen schools, and on the low end, that's you know fifteen hundred two G's a pop. So that's yeah. a, that's yeah. a, we're talking about twenty thousand dollars here. Would you bring a white person on stage and embarrass them for twenty k? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but he brought on too many motherfuckers on the stage. <laughs> Oh, no. and, and there's a part in the soldier boy, like every other fucking line dance where you have to take like three steps to the right. You hop three steps to the right while looking to the left. So you don't know where you're hopping to. <laughs> and this fucking girl hopped right off the fucking oh. stage, bro. She fucking <laughs> failed. They're like, it's just one. I can see that in the news. Like 20 white people <laughs> perished tragically <laughs> at a college conference. Cranking soldier yeah. boy. I think you say the stage collapsed. <laughs> <laughs> she fucking fell, and it was like, oh, like one of those, oh, oh. my God, mo- momentum dead. Yeah. And that was his closer. <laughs> that was his closer. <laughs> oh. And at these college conferences, there's a countdown clock on the stage, and if you disrespect the clock, you're essentially, you're like labeled unbookable and all of this uh-huh. shit. Yeah. So he has to respect the clock. <laughs> he has to fucking go good night. She just fell off. Are you old? Good night. I gotta go. I gotta respect the clock. So he goes off stage. The MC comes on and brings up the next motherfucker. There is an injury. We have to. This isn't soccer. You don't just keep playing while a motherfucker's on the ground. She was okay in the long run, but in that moment, no one knew. Thought she was fucked up. So imagine being the comedian. Fuck a Green Bay Packer, the Falcons one yeah. and Lambo intro. Imagine walking up and there's just literally like 20 people huddled around a moaning fucking white teenager. <laughs> and you got to do your jokes. And the clock is running. And you're not going to get this. There's no stoppage time. They don't your bit is also getting white people on stage to dance. <laughs> and no one's volunteering anymore. <laughs> They've seen what happens. <laughs> There's a million fucked up ways to be brought up on stage, is my point. That's the problem with those college ones. I had a good friend. He, he said, like, oh, I bombed it. I was like, how'd you bomb? You're a great comic. And he said, the comic, the person before me did jokes while on a pogo stick. Uh, and I was like, oh, well, then you just did less. Yeah. That's all you did. <laughs> like the last guy. Well, here's it without the cool hey, tricks. You just go into autopilot on a college show. They're not going to remember. even if they. Hate. No one remembers comedians they hate. They just remember the ones that made them feel a negative emotion mm-hmm. you're just not funny that's fine they'll just leave yeah they'll snapchat you to your friends and t- tiktok you but no one fucking knows no one knows who you are lie I about s- your name i saw one guy it was apka uh which one of the conferences i'm like he just he just does impressions and the whole thing was like after the show i'll do an instagram story where i'm the rock and i'm like the rock smells that stacy sucks and then you put that on your story, and, and he cleaned the fuck up. There was a group that I opened for. Fuck, how long ago was this? 2015, 2016, maybe? Um, they're popular YouTubers. They're really good. The Fung Brothers. So what I started learning with, like, Instagram and YouTubers and the sketch, internet sketch, as they like to fucking call them and uh-huh. fucking slander them. <laughs> <laughs> College kids don't care. They just want to be entertained. We're the ones that are all stick up our ass about the art and the performance and the structure of the show. And uh, Why am I opening for the Fung Brothers? I've been on Star Search. They have not been on Star Search. 
Don't give a fuck, man. Them kids don't watch it. Yeah. I go to a college show. I'm Kip Adada. Mm-hmm. I'm the fucking OG from the fucking, I did Letterman. Who? Yeah. You yeah. fucking dinosaur. <laughs> and I'm like, bitch, do you know who Letterman is? I go up, I do my time. I do the best jokes I have at that particular point in my career. And I feel like I did really well. Fung Brothers go up and you wouldn't have been able to follow it. You wouldn't have been able to follow it. Regardless of the structure of it, there were some jokes. It was a lot of crowd interaction. And I also distinctly remember at some point they had candy and they were throwing candy. Like it's not the act. It's not like it was Gallagher. Where yeah, just come yeah, yeah. Out just fucking throw candy. But I just remember sitting in the back of the state, in the back of the room, and I was going, oh, there's just a whole nother plethora of shit that I could be doing here at these college shows that I, cause you're literally their first live entertainment mm-hmm. for the most part. So it was like, Oh, it doesn't fucking matter at a college, all this art shit. That's for the clubs and the road and for grown ups. But at a college, just fucking, if you want to get on a pogo stick, all right, yeah, yeah. you're not gonna have a long career like most comedy clubs have a low ceiling. The fire coats, <laughs> you know, colleges yeah. you're performing into high ceiling venues. <laughs> so go ahead, go Pogo man, get your yeah. money. Uh, just become Pogo man and just never leave the college scene and just become that guy. There's comedians making droves of money doing shit that we would never do as club comics, but. Somebody's got to fucking do it. So fuck it. I remember I lost a comedy contest at Florida State. I didn't go to Florida State. I lied. Like, I went to Florida State so I could get in the comedy contest. I went to Florida A&M. And I lost the comedy contest to a guy who pissed his pants as his closer. <laughs> oh, he man. left a puddle. And he was like third out of ten comics. And it's just a puddle of It was piss. real. He did it? He, he really man. did it. It wasn't like yeah. a... Yeah. Oh. He fucking... Drink a lot of water pre-show and like fucking what was let that shit marinate about being scared in a haunted house or some shit. It was something. It was something where he didn't need to piss. I mean, that's impressive. <laughs> it was Most a bit where he could have just described if he painted yeah. the picture properly with with prose. We could have imagined him pissing his sure. Pants. Yeah, that's not easy though. I think I said on this podcast once. I used to, I used to be more of an actor. And there was a time that I wanted to be scared in a scene. And I wanted to know what it was like to piss myself. And so, maybe I didn't say it. You're looking at me terrified. No, you never I went told in me the, this. I went into the shower in my apartment in Philly. I was deep into acting. But you're clothed. Clothed. And I remember trying to piss myself just in the shower. In the shower, yeah. fully clothed. Just to feel like, what is it for the body to go to a place where that happens? And it took a it took a while. Figured I definitely could muscle. not do it on stage mid bit. He did it on stage mid bit, and there's just you're not gonna beat pissing on stage. There's just nothing you can do. <laughs> no. You can't follow that. There's it, no there joke. There must be water on the stage. You went up after that. Yes, the water. Yes. There was water. six more six more stage. comics went up after that. It was like one of them big rugs on the stage. So it's just a big wet spot in the rug and everybody's just performing. So everyone else's performance is watching you perform around the wet spot. Yeah. So even when he left the stage, his show was still about him. Yeah. You're not going to win. The only way you could win is if I would have to, you'd have to abandon the set and just riff off. Yeah, and just be in the moment. In the high. second one, no way. The first comic has a chance to maybe ride that piss to glory. <laughs> the second comic, what can you say? It's still here. Yeah. yeah. Could sh- someone get this, please? Or shit on stage. Yeah, you got shit on stage. You got <laughs> yeah. up the ante. Stop it. <laughs> By the end, the stage was covered in piss, shit, and cum. <laughs> Paulie Shore was in Birmingham one year, and he went off stage to take a shit and took the mic with him. Kept doing bits from the bathroom. <laughs> Never stop performing. <laughs> it's his audience, so they like respect. Like, sure, it's not like this is a showcase night at an improv. Yeah, yeah. This is <laughs> this wasn't his SNL yeah. audition. Yeah, this is Birmingham on a Friday night. These people are here for Paulie to be Paulie. Like, this is what they fucking want. And he goes, hey, "Yeah, I'll be right back." And he just took the mic with him, and just you hear the toilet lid clank down, and he just fucking does bits. I get a. Uh, 
you know, I started stand up in New York, and sometimes I hear about like kind of real road stories, and I feel like it's a it's an a segment I'll never have as a comic, like performing like your stories about. I I saw you do the one about uh, uh, this like booking a show in advance. You sell the the booker got some drugs and they'd sell the drugs so they could pay the comics. Yeah, the dope boy shows. Yeah, yeah, dope boy shows. Yeah, you do shows where essentially if a drug dealer has all of his product either stolen or confiscated by law enforcement if you're a drug dealer and you have no money you have no product and you need money to start shit back up again the quickest way to get front money is to do a rap show or a comedy show like where i'm from down south that's what most dope boys would do real fast it's just hey i got some comedians coming and the tickets are twenty dollars the show is in a month you book the comedians, you tell the comedians you're going to pay them, you pre-sell tickets, you take the pre-sale money, you buy dope, you flip the dope, but you have to flip the dope by showtime so that you have money to pay the performers. And then you're back even with yourself, and then you can continue your crime, criminal enterprise. And that works perfectly fine if you can flip the dope before the show. And so these guys, they have bought a bunch of dope with the pre-sale money, and they hadn't flipped it yet. And when we got to the show, they were like, can we pay you in dope? <laughs> or can you wait a week for your money? But we also don't have the money to refund the audience. Mm. Because all we have is dope. dope. <laughs> <laughs> so some of us stayed, some of us left, you know, like, fuck this. This is, you're, you're never going to fucking send me the money. And it turns out they ended up Western Union and the comedians who performed, they got paid. They eventually did get their fucking money. Like, they were, like, honorable fucking drug dealers. That's nice. But, yeah, like, shit like that. But the the difference, though, I think we're... Because I've thought about this. Like, I've always told comics, like, the, the biggest mistake that I feel like I made in my career was staying down south too long. Mm-hmm. Like, I was nine years. There's nothing in the first nine years of comedy in the south and the Midwest. There, there's no lesson that you couldn't have learned in the first four. yeah. You've learned them all. You've seen them all. Get to the coast. Because if you're going to be miserable and broke, be miserable and broke around other people that are driven. Because the way I compare it is like, you had a comedy classroom, though. I didn't have a proper classroom. Mm -hmm. You had other students. You had classmates. You had really great instructors who were the best of the best every fucking night who were fucking like always elevating and the right that you earn in New York and LA and San Francisco, Chicago, maybe I would even say Denver and Minneapolis, you work your way up to being able to work with the best of the best and see that every fucking night, every night, if you want to, you could see a fucking PhD level comedian Mm. do seven minutes and then see him the next night with the adjustments they made from the night before. Yeah. I'm opening for a guy called the Disgruntled Clown. This is not disrespect to Disgruntled Clown. I'm just giving perspective because that's the type of act that would never get booked in New York. And it's also, it's niche, it's it's a road act. And so the whole thing, it's a guy... Who's just he he plays the he assumes the role of a clown that got kicked out the circus because he was too real for this shit or whatever and so for forty five minutes full makeup full costume he performs as a clown that's fed up like imagine a clown that's a drunk at a bar after a show and then plays goofy pranks on people in the audience and he he has a following but if I'm trying to better my joke about gun control. <laughs> I'm not getting anything by watching the disgruntled clown. And even if the disgruntled clown or any Southern road act that hasn't been on TV in a while, if I'm opening for you four nights in a row, four cities, I can watch you make a couple of adjustments, but you are who you are. I don't get the gift of watching 10 fucking different comedians, 10 different styles every night. Yeah. So low key, I feel like the road starting on the road is like being homeschooled in a way because you only know as much as your parent. Mm -hmm. Like a homeschool kid is only as good as the parent where you have multiple instructors. It's just this week, this is your guy. 
angry guy who Leno used to open for who does not want you to bring up the fucking Atlanta Falcons at any point yeah. before bringing him on stage ever again. You know, and there's there's lessons to be learned. The one advantage I, I would argue, though, that I had is that I was able to have more intimate moments yeah. with the PhD level comics once I had them in the city because I'm with you for three, four days. We sooner or later we got to talk, motherfucker. Like you yeah. can't just run out of the club like that. All that unapproachable shit at the cellar table bullshit before you get past at the cellar. Mm-hmm. Don't look him in the eyes and don't talk to him and all of that. Fuck that. Hello, George Wallace. Yeah. Get, my name is Roy. I'm your feature. I'm here to pick you up and take you to all of the fucking gigs. Yeah. So you would have those moments, but there are just a lot of guys that there are a lot of comedians that just use the road in lieu of pursuing whatever it is they're really passionate about, but they're no longer passionate about comedy. And to watch that four nights a week is not, was not helping my growth. Mm. The aggregate, I would say the aggregate of that is probably net negative because for every real moment with like George Wallace or Theo Vidal or, you know, Dale Hughley, Adele Givens, you know, these are people that all did me real solids on the road and I got to know them on a way, on a level that I wouldn't have had I been a city comic. You're opening for a lot of people that are just fucking drunks. They haven't changed a syllable of their act in fucking years and they're still getting booked ahead of you and that shit is demoralizing. That's what blows me away though. I would get so bored. I struggle. I struggle fine-tuning stuff. That's, that's where I get to people who do the same act for, for especially when they're just doing 15 especially they'll hop around I mean I worked LOL I still work LOL sometimes mm-hmm. and like there's some older comics and you're like don't you are you bored you're bored or you're afraid of trying now imagine opening for that motherfucker in Paducah Kentucky on a Wednesday night <laughs> and he's doing an hour and then y'all have to ride together to Clarksville Tennessee the next day and then you have to do five hours to Charleston, West Virginia the next day. What the fuck do you talk about? What knowledge are you soaking up? What yeah. game are you getting? You're flying blind, essentially. But, like, there's guys, man, there's just so many guys who I feel like could have been great, but they just didn't. It, the cool thing, the one advantage to being on the road early is that you get a sneak preview of every possible ending to this career. Mm-hmm. Like the great ones, and Tommy Davidson and Sinbad's where, oh, wow, you've been working three decades, four decades in Sinbad's case. Like you've been working forever and you're still loved in generations. I remember opening for John Witherspoon and a table was a granddad, father and a son. Like that, when you, when you get that three generational fucking career and it's not a lot of comics that break that barrier, like that shit. I'm like, oh, cool. But then I also turn around the next week and could be opening for a guy who's in the middle of a custody dispute with his ex-wife, and he promised the judge that he wouldn't bring his fucking eight-year-old daughter to a comedy club because that was part of the custody agreement. And then I walk in backstage, and there's a fucking eight-year-old, and, hey, kid, watch my daughter while I'm on stage. Mm. So now I'm fucking feature act slash babysitter (laughs) for the whole fucking weekend. So it's... It's that shit, man. Yeah. You know, um, alcoholism, suicide, womanizing, people who fuck the waitresses, disrespect the staff. I've seen it all. Uh, and I, you, you don't get all of that in New York or L.A. when you're starting. And I think that's where, like, a lot of the monster asshole comics come from. They're just ones who just never – they were just never mm. – they never got the primer on how to behave, what the decorum is when you're out, when you're mm-hmm. in middle America. I can't imagine doing this with a kid, stand-up comedy. I just can't even imagine. You can't do it. You can't do it without a good fucking co-parent. Yeah. That's the trick, is that you have to have someone who like really understands what you do and why you do it. Um, I I lucked out 
in that regard. But then also the Daily Show gave me a level of stability, job sure. wise. Mm. But like like road dogging, like I was early on. I don't know. I, like I know guys. I opened for them, five kids. Ugh. And I know this is five nights, eight hundred. I know what this fucking run pays. Yeah. You know, all right, you work your way up, then you might get 1200 or something like that. In my fantasy, the kids are helping with the merch table. Like, they, I'm immediately Oh, those exist. All of them. <laughs> oh, those, oh, you want to see some comedy? Fucking go to a Miss Pat show. Miss Pat, have oh, her yeah? when, they, when they're not in school, Miss Pat put her daughters to fucking work. <laughs> hey. <laughs> they be folding shirts and taking pictures and fucking passing out QR codes for mailing lists. I told her, my girlfriend, and she she's a manager at Mosaic. But when she's on the road, she becomes she becomes towel towel gal. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, yeah, uh, the kid thing that is it's very feels overwhelming. You know, I have seen. Here's a, here's a lesson that you can't get on the that you can't get in this city. I have seen what being in a in a relationship with the person that doesn't support you does to a comedian to a comedian psyche mm. over time. Because you can see a guy two three times, and then the fourth time you work with him, you're like, oh, she doesn't like what you do, and you're trying to make it work. Mm. Poor b- fucking bastard. And then year five, you found out he quit the business, and now he's like doing something that's completely to the left. That's not even entertainment adjacent. Yeah. And then three, four years later, you find out he's divorced, and then he's like trying to get back out on the road. But now, when you quit for a year, it's like a three year regression. It's it's like, got to be, it's it can't I mean, it has to be awful dating. Like I, I sent to Tova, I was like, I booked uh, eight weekends next year at all the House of Comedies. Nice. I'm like, hey, baby, they're four day weekends. We could go to some. And she looked at all the cities, and she's like, Nah, I think I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, and then I, and then I start looking at cities, you know, outside yeah. the glow of I just got booked. I'm like, Oh yeah, oh, I don't yeah. really want to go to Fort Wayne either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, I guess going back to Edmonton for four days isn't that exciting. <laughs> the mall's cool for half a day. I used to do day labor if I was anywhere, like back in my younger days, if I was anywhere more than two days, fuck it. I'll pick up a shift. I got damn. shit else to do. Wow. What kind what of job could you get with, with just a, a day? Do you fucking construction bullshit. Sometimes you'd look up and get a keyboard and you fucking work in some bullshit office or some shit, but usually it was construction. Like You can go. It's not good money. But if you just need money today, yeah, you can go to like at least in the south and the Midwest, and I don't mean day labor in a sense of like standing on the corner in front of a Home Depot type shit. Yeah, but like you can go to like a temp service and just go. You go at six in the morning, you sign a fucking sheet, and as people call and go, I need three people, I need four people, like whatever job you could just call a service at six in the morning, just send me. Two dumb motherfuckers to do this thing. It's very basic, repetitive shit. Like, I remember in Columbia, South Carolina, I worked for, in those days, the club in Columbia would book the MCs for two weeks straight. It was a six-night room, which was like a rarity in the in the business, let alone yeah. the South. It was a comedy house theater. It was a Tuesday through Sunday room, and they would book their MCs in two-week blocks, so you had Mondays off. I'm not driving all the way back to Birmingham on a Monday. So fuck it. I'll just pick up a shift. So I would come in town Sunday night and they would give me the hotel. The hotel would let me check in early because it was, you know, all with the comedy club, yeah. order, which is another thing. Young comedians, most comedy clubs have a deal with the hotel. So you usually can get in town a day early and they're not cost nothing. If you know how to fucking spit that game on the phone. <laughs> um, and I remember I, I worked, my assignment was a quick creep fit. There, there's a, at least at the time, there was a quick creep factory. And they just processed instant cement. And my only function in life for eight hours a day was taking five pound bags of quick creep and putting them on a pallet. Three by three in a little staggered 
lattice formation. You stack them eight high. Another guy comes with the cellophane, wraps it, a fucking forklift dude. He's getting the good money. Make sure you get you a forklift <laughs> license, young blood. That's what they'd say to you. <laughs> like they were giving me advice. <laughs> you take the pallet, put it on the back of an 18-wheeler. You fill an 18-wheeler. 18 18-wheeler 18 pulls off. A new one pulls in. Wash, rinse, repeat. You do that for eight hours. You get lunch for 30 minutes at noon. And then I would go home at 5.30, back to the hotel, pick the fucking little fucking balls of concrete out of my hair that it mixed with the sweat, brush my hair, put on my bullshit suit, go to the club, bomb, <laughs> go home. <laughs> bomb with your new forklift <laughs> material. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> bomb, go to bed, and wake up at 5.30 a.m. Can you to make sure... Can, can you talk about like that transition from the road comic to... To now here, like what? What did you have something that made you move, or, or was it just couldn't do that kind of life anymore and decided to move? I had a good year in two thousand six, like just in terms of like accomplishments uh -huh. and shit. I had I'd already done one or two colleges. I'd already done one or two college conferences the year before. And I did okay. Okay meaning I booked maybe 15 schools, maybe 12 schools, which in those days were paying the G a piece. So that was off. So I was still doing morning radio as well during this whole time. So that was, it was enough. Like I was doing well to live in Birmingham. My rent was 575 off Alford Avenue. God damn, I missed that fucking apartment. And then at the top of, at the top of 06, I do a NACA, and I book 93 schools. Ooh, wow. 93? Jesus Christ. A record at the time, Christella Alonzo broke it. I think she broke 100. I'd have to text her to find out the exact number. But That's it insane. Was, it was just one of those fucking gigs, bro, just in the zone. Every fucking joke was just perfect. I was on the perfect night, on the perfect show on that night, in the perfect spot in the lineup on that night. Like, just every what you want at these conferences. These kids come in on Thursday. You don't want Thursday because all the schools aren't there yet. You want Friday, but you want Friday late enough in the night where every school is there and checked into the hotel. So you don't really want that 7 o'clock show. You want that 9 o'clock show. Sweet spot is the 10 o'clock show but early in the 10 o'clock show because they've been traveling all day, they're tired. Yeah. So if you can perform anywhere in that conference on a Friday night between 8.30 and 10.30, you have the best statistical chance of fucking... It's set up for you to succeed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, it's essentially lottery system and connections with who your agent knows within the college country. that that a lot of that dictates who performs when well last year your guy got the sweet spot my guy never gets the sweet spot get one of my guys so it's that shit that your people your reps have to navigate so that's february i booked 93 schools for the next school year so i know for sure this is 06 i know for sure fiscally 2007 is straight I'm playing with house money. So bills are paid. And then Montreal comes around in June. I do the Montreal Comedy Festival, which is essentially the AAU, NBA draft, combine, fucking, it's the thing. Magical fucking set. Mm -hmm. Just everything fucking lines up. As I'm coming off stage, Guy comes up, shakes my hand. Hey, how you doing, brother? Eddie Brill, David Letterman. That was fucking amazing. What you did. Three months later, I'm on Letterman. So at this point, it's August. And I've done Letterman. Now, backstory. So there was a Southern chain. This is a thing that a lot of the Southern clubs would do to comics, especially black ones, where... At this point, I've done, I've done all the black shows for comedy. I've done BT's Comic View. I've done Showtime at the Apollo. I've done Live at Hollywood. The only thing left was Def Jam. I hadn't done Def Jam yet. On the white side, I'd done Premium Blend. 
I had done Star Search, Comedy Central's premium blend at the time, and I had done Star Search and got to the semifinals. These bookers were always saying, we can't promote you from feature act to headliner because you don't have credits. You don't have any credits I can use. Every credit I brought them, every year of my resume from 01 to to today, I've been on television every year of my career. Even if it was only once, I've been on television every year. So from 01 to 06, I had a sustained record of being on TV that year, more so than the headliners you were booking ahead of me who hadn't been on TV in a decade. Mm -hmm. It's no disrespect to them, but if you're saying credits and relevance are the thing that matter, I went and got what you said I needed to get, and motherfuckers kept moving the goalposts. I booked Letterman, and there were a couple of clubs. One day I'm going to fucking name names. (laughs) (laughs) So... There were a couple of clubs. There was a chain that was essentially 60, maybe 70% of my road work, proper club work, not counting colleges, but just when I work a club, 70% of the time, it is this company. That company did not want to promote me from middle act to headliner. We're talking about a, you know, this is a, this is a nice little bump. We're talking about going from 500 a week to maybe 800 a week to maybe 900 a week which is a lot of fucking money and I've been on fucking Letterman I did it I did what the fuck there is no more at that time there is no credit more pristine than David Letterman you could argue Leno but Letterman was more picky so it was like oh, you're on Letterman because Letterman hates a lot of people uh-huh. but he liked you you know so so I go to this company and I go it's time Fucking move me up. And they wouldn't move me up. And so I was like, well, well, then if I'm just going to fucking be broke or if I'm just going to just fucking work and not be happy, I'll just do it from somewhere else. And at this point, the Letterman Heat's got me some meetings with CBS and I think I'm going to get my sitcom and go on my Ray Romano journey. Uh So fuck it. I'll just leave. And I got the colleges to back me fiscally. Yeah. So... I'll just fucking dip. And it was the best thing I could have ever done because what happens in the South, and this is something that I'll give New York and LA, these clubs don't necessarily do, but in the South, these bookers want you to feel like you owe them Mm. for booking you. Mm -hmm. You know, like they're the ones doing you a favor. Like you couldn't go out and just create your own fucking stage at some point if you really had the gump. If you really sat and looked at the business model, you could do what they do. But like this idea of, oh, I need them. And uh, what if I don't book no more colleges? And then I can't do no more shows for that company. However, you'll figure it out. You're fucking running in fog. This whole fucking career. That's the funny thing is that you get to this point in your career. You still don't know what the fuck you're going to do. Sure. Not at all. It doesn't fucking. Oh, you're on the daily show. Yeah. Well, my boss just resigned. I don't know what the fuck I'm going to (laughs) do. I don't know what the fuck's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> like, like I, and I have a kid now. Yeah. Um, well, before we, before we reach, reach our end, I did want to talk about, uh, you know, I, I was home for Thanksgiving and, um, I had lots of divorced family. So I had my, uh, traditional second Thanksgiving with my father, uh, the, on a Friday. That's interesting. How did you do that? So you do both. You don't like oscillate. Did you uh, growing up? Did you oscillate? Did your parents like? Uh, well, so growing up, so there was a there was a brief window where we tried all together, the all together Thanksgiving. Oh, no so matter divorce, what, so we are a family, even though we're in. Uh-huh. Oh, so my mom had bro. married my dad's former lawyer. Jesus, oh, my God. Get this, I found I found this out recently. So my dad, my dad cheated on my mom. He's kind yeah. of a, a lot of cheating. And I found out that uh, my my mom says that my dad might still think that it was his former lawyer, my stepdad, former stepdad technically, was the one who ratted him out. So my my mom said that my dad thinks my stepfather ratted him out about the cheating. To this day, she never told your dad how... Oh, he no. just doesn't well, believe the story. My mom, I told the story on here, and then my mom said, uh, we might have a new segment where my mom corrects all the stories <laughs> I tell. So she she said what happened was she was with my dad, 
Dad's a good looking guy, businessman, runs his own company. And uh, a, a friend of my mom at like a dinner party said, Hey, I don't, I don't know how to say this, but my husband reads people pretty well. And he's convinced that uh, your husband's cheating on you. Wait. And my mom said that hey, her she husband <laughs> reads pe- like like her like, husband spent cheater. time with my dad and like you know oh, said like okay. I think that guy's cheating on her and told his wife and his wife told my mom and my mom was like I totally like <laughs> shot the messenger I left the party immediately she was like I, I gotta leave so she called <laughs> she had no idea she she has no idea no idea. <laughs> no idea so this is what's amazing so my mom called my dad and said uh, someone saw you at dinner with another woman. We nice. need to talk. Bluffed. Based on this person's husband's suspicion. And he folded. And my mom said she said it was like a pinball machine where it's like, oh, this makes sense. This makes sense. This makes sense. It all seemed to click. And my dad she said, so she said, uh, uh, someone saw you at dinner with another woman. Or I did. And my dad said, I'll be right home. Fuck. And fucking. That's it. That's it. And that was it. They, they, There was no... He, he went home, he said, he said, he said, he said, I'm Italian. That motherfucker talked without a lawyer. He, I'm it's Italian. like the police. He got called in for questioning and he fucking <laughs> answered too many questions at the police station. <laughs> he said, I'm Italian. He said, classically, which he said, you know, I'm never going to change. Like a very, like that's, if I, if I were to, his character description, that's his. I got a fucking guma. It is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, okay. So you tried Thanksgiving and together. That's so it. yeah, one time we did a big Thanksgiving together and it was like the dynamics. Cause my stepfather, he grew up in Ohio. My dad would never hit, would never hit uh, uh, as punishment for kids or anything. Mm-hmm. My stepfather was different and he would never hit me. My stepfather never hit me, but he had kids, my half siblings. Correct. So, you know, uh, they, they mixed their mashed potatoes and peas and my stepfather, he'd say, present your hand. And then they would, and he'd give him a slap on the hand and they'd cry. I don't know if it's from the pain or just the shame, but then my father had a problem with it. And by the end of Thanksgiving, everyone's screaming at each other. You don't fucking do kids like that. Yeah. 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 And meanwhile, there's this other thing. My dad thought that he was the one who told my mom, that he was cheating Underneath so he all could of get that. with her. So I already hate you just off yeah, the strength. Yeah. Custody, all sorts of, I mean. Yeah, I mean, the lawyer broke bro code. I get yeah. that. But, like, yeah, I, I can see why your dad will forever <laughs> hold that part instead of just respecting the fact, oh, someone's going to treat her right and maybe that's good for my boy yeah. to have another man in the house. Sure. Yeah. Well, they got divorced too. But, yeah, my dad. I think when I was a kid, my stepfather for sure was the enemy of my life. He was the bad guy. And my dad was the greatest person alive. When I went to his house, he was uh, a bachelor. You know, he had girlfriends throughout the years and eventually remarried and then divorced. But he was he was amazing. I loved him. He bought me whatever I wanted. He spoiled me. He hung out with me because he didn't have any friends. And then as I got older, you see why so many of the problems are because of him. I didn't know about any of the cheating until I was 18, 19, 20. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's why all these relationships ended suddenly. Why did my stepmom leave all of a sudden? And then you're like, oh, because he was cheating while she was pregnant. Yeah. Gotcha. And she's like, yeah, whatever happened, I don't talk about her. Yeah. She's old news. Yeah. And so now I do the Thanksgivings all separate. And this, my mom's in L.A., so I just went home. I had this Thanksgiving with my stepfather, which I'm sure is a slap to, in my father's face for me to yeah. do the main meal with my stepfather. But it's peaceful. It's a full meal. Yeah. Friday, we go to my dad's. My sister's taking care of the stuff she gets. She thought oven ready meant it's already cooked. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. So I, I have shows that night. I'm doing shows in D.C. I do it every Thanksgiving weekend. And so we get back, she puts it in, and it's like, oh, it needs three hours in the oven. We only have an hour and a half. <laughs> She's way off. And so and I'm, my girlfriend's there, and we say to my dad, uh, you know, let's just have the sides and the stuffing and have a good meal. And he's like, no, we have to have the turkey. have the turkey. So we wait an hour, hour 15, looking at this turkey, looking pretty pink. <laughs> And then we, my dad, my dad takes it out and he says, he says, 
The outsides are fine. <laughs> <laughs> he's cutting the turkey. Bitch. Cutting the turkey is pinker and pinker the deeper he goes. And he's like, no, this is, this is as cooked as it can be. And <laughs> fucking medium whale turkey. And he's taking bites. And we're not, we're not, we're not touching this shit. There's no way. Medium so, rare, <laughs> hour and a half turkey. He says, "Me and my sister are, are my, uh, me and my sister, my girlfriend, my dad, and and they're, my sister's trying to placate my dad, like, oh yeah, it looks good.'" And she turns to me like, "Don't eat it. <laughs> Don't eat it. Whatever you do." And uh, uh, it was just a very classic single, single dad Thanksgiving, you know. Yeah, I'm trying to figure that out with my kid. Like this year, we did the. He was with me and my mom. Mm -hmm. Like, like right now, because he's six, so it's like, all right, here's one grandma and presenting the other grandma. (laughs) So you got like two fucking things, but I, you know, I don't know. Wait, these grandmas are who? So wait, one on my side, one on her side. Okay, got it. So. But it was never anything that was, like, really discussed. It's just, like, my mom, she's, like, she's the chill grandma that doesn't really do shit. She's not going to play with you. But we'll talk a little. They'll talk and read and play piano. Like, she's she's just more laid back. Yeah. Her mom is, like, let's go walk. Let's go to the park. Let's go play. What are you into? I'm going to get down on the ground and play with you. So he likes that shit, too. So it's, like, I don't want to deny him. One over there, because I think that's stupid too, is to be in any type of relationship where it's my turn. Yeah. So you gotta fucking respect that it's my turn with him. Yeah. And then you just fucking sit the kid on the couch with an iPad for three days. Yeah. When he could be rocking out with the other grandma and some of his cousins and all of these other like just mix it up. So yeah. Now forgive me. Are you st- are you still married? No, 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 no. We're not. We're not together. Oh, you're not together. Yeah, correct, okay, correct. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, but it's like one of those things where, as you figure out, like as a father, I'm trying to figure out. Okay, well, he's how much of whatever is next for me do I let him in on, and when do I let him in on that? Because I don't want him to just see me just dating regular motherfuckers. Like I, I don't think that that's I don't know. I do not know how you do it. I don't know what purpose well. that serves from an educational on some man school shit. And if I'm his instructor outside of how to treat a woman and how to be cordial and to show affection so he can see affection and love. And it, like, yeah, you can see normalcy. But like you just said, he's going to start putting it all together on the backside. Yeah, of course. And, yeah. And if I'm doing anything wrong now, he's. He's going to see it. He's going to fucking notice that so-and-so is completely out of it. Because when you stop talking to someone, you don't talk to your kids about that shit. You don't. Like, Son, yeah. I just want you to know that she's a skank. And yeah. Fucking, yeah. You, the, you can't. Holes be lying, son. And sometimes you got to get them to fuck up. You, you my dad introduced to a lot of people. Right? Oh, I mean, yeah. my dad, he, he slept with my kindergarten teacher. He dated her briefly. While you were in kindergarten, or like, were you like in second grade? Maybe like, first grade. But then my mom told the school and she got fired. So like that, that was intense. She he he there were a lot of women. Mom was on the warpath. Yeah. But again, like I'll learn a detail. Like oh, my dad fucked her during nap time. And then it's like, okay, maybe she should have been fired. Like I always <laughs> learn I always learn somehow oh, it always goes back to it was justified, in fact. But he I had a lot of women in my life. I, I, I've had so many women break up with me as, you know, my dad's partner letting me down because we would have a relationship and they would come to me. I remember one very distinctly, this woman, she came over, we played Monopoly all the time and she kind of sat me down in the car. You know, that's the little private space outside the home in the car. Like, Hey, I got a new job. I'm going to be really busy. Uh, so I don't think I'm going to be around here much anymore. Joe Marco. And I'm like, Oh, we still going to play Monopoly. And she was like, oh, yeah, we'll play Monopoly. Then a year later, I see her at Dwayne Reed with, with a new man and a baby in her arms. Uh, like, oh. How oh. did that How did that fuck with you? Or did that fuck with you at all as an adult in your relationship with women? Well, my girlfriend says that I'm a perfect boyfriend, oh. which has been nice. So no, not at all. Uh, no, it's deeply. I think it. 
uh, I think I just knew very early on what it was to have a loved one who then was no longer a part of your life at all. And so I feel very adverse to when people talk about they break up with someone. My girlfriend, we do fight about this. Where someone breaks up with you have an ex or whatever, and then you're like, we don't speak anymore. Oh, yeah. We're not friends. We have no relationship. Yeah. I find that childish. You're telling me you love this person. You're telling me this person was like a part of your life, and you met you met their family. They knew your ups and downs and your journey, and the way you've decided to deal with the fact that you no longer. Are, are fucking or having a romantic relationship is you can never speak again. To me, because I, I witnessed what it was like to feel family like that, where these women were my family. They were my mother figure. Correct. And then because my dad and them broke up, I no longer had them in my life at all. Felt insane to me. You felt insulted by them. Insulted or just... Just a, a, a loneliness and emptiness. My sister's uh, mom, who was my <clears throat> stepmom, you know, when she left, my dad said she was, you know, she was a little bit crazy, and and uh, you know, her, she had a fucked up family, and and that's why. And it turns out, you know, he was cheating, and it was a bad relationship, all sorts of reasons, and. I don't know what hole that left. There was this woman who was my stepmom, who I introduced as my stepmom, who I, I, I remember one, once a, a, a kid at school made fun of her, and I almost, it's the closest I ever got to hitting someone. And then she vanishes. My dad no longer wants to speak about her. I have no way of talking to her. She'll text, once you get a phone, she can text me on birthday, you know, happy yeah. birthday, I still think about you. And I didn't respond for years and years and years because I was like, well, there's no relationship here. Yeah, and now as an adult, you know, during COVID, she sent food supplies, and I'm gonna go to my sister's graduation in December and like see her. And as an adult, now I'm like, let's push past these awkward feelings I have and try to have a conversation with this woman. But I think it's just that I I had family that 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 vanished without explanation. Yeah, and and it's a different kind of a breakup for me if I'm speaking about some of the exes that I don't talk to anymore and some of it was me being a piece <clears> of shit and not being a good fucking dude. And then other ones, it was just fucking circumstance. Like I'm moving to LA and you <coughs> travel, you travel 20 days a month mm -hmm. here in Birmingham. The, 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 the dynamic was, she traveled Monday through Thursday. I traveled Thursday through Sunday. And we had tried and tried. And this is just living locally to make it work. When we'd have one or two days in Birmingham. And then when I left to go to L.A., I knew I was going to lose those couple of days. And I can't afford at this point to just keep flying back for fucking date night. And you can't fucking. Fly. So. It just ended up being a thing that ended once I moved to L.A. We kept in touch here and there for a while, but I think ultimately, even in the relationships where you're, where you were the catalyst for the breakup, I think it's still natural to miss the person. I think it's still natural to still miss that love. And for me, a lot of it's been rooted in, I believe that to some degree, because you never stop loving, I believe you never stop loving a person. I believe that you have a finite amount of love. It's infinite. But as you break up, as you have breakups over life, I believe that certain parts of your heart become partitioned for other people mm -hmm. that you know you can never be with, you know you can never do anything with. So a guy like me, I never stop mourning that. Yeah. So mm. to be in your presence to talk to you, any of that shit. I'm still missing you in real time. And that fucks with me. And it's also in disrespect to whoever the fuck I'm with now. Because this will never work. So it's just, it's... But that's the challenge. Is that disrespect, that, that feeling, which I feel like is the way that we've just set up. This is where I start going, like, tear down the 
patriarchy, the, the religious roots that make us believe in this sense of like, you only have this kind of love for one person. I don't even mean sex. Yeah. Sex is whatever. That's, that's, I, I, I just think that like, I've grown up in a world and I've, I've been the victim as a kid, at least of, of these, these very, like you're with someone, all this intensity or you no hate one else. Or you and hate then them. when people yeah. get divorced and they share custody, I go, Oh, I wonder why it's a bad fucking custody arrangement. Maybe it's because the whole society has been set up to force people to stay together. I mean, we, we still live in the system that wants just, you stay married forever and then you die as a, as a unit. And you produce, and so so if people can't have healthy breakups, then good luck with the healthy fucking divorce. Yeah, I I think that, and that's something that I've had to kind of come to grips with with my own breakup is this idea that you know, without even getting into the dynamics of what it all is now, but it's something that works for both of us. It's something we've had conversations about. No matter what, she still comes first. I never stopped loving you. And, I, and we have a kid, so I don't have the luxury of never talking to you ever again. Yeah. That's gone. And he is my priority. There's nothing more important to me than him and him having my son having the best possible circumstances to be set up to have a decent life. So in order for him to be good, that means she got to be good. So you're an ally. I'm never going to be your enemy. I'm never going to fucking work in opposition to you. I'm never going to be one of these. I can't stand my, 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 my son, mama, these bitches be tripping. I'm never going to fucking be that. Now try having that realization and then explaining that to someone new who you're dating, yeah. who is entrenched in all of the me, me, me. And I come first. And why did, why, why they call in that? Like, that hasn't happened yet, but that's the general thing that happens is it's it's women want to know where they where am i in your ap top 25 poll rankings and i can't i cannot say with distinct clarity yet that you're above my son yeah you're not above my son and she's team son therefore she's above you sure yeah yeah and I'm not, we're not, but, but that's why dating yeah. with kids feels it's so much deeper than just if I'm dating someone with a kid, I think I would have to have an open enough heart to someday love that kid. And my dad would date women with kids. You gotta fucking love her too, motherfucker. Yeah. Because yeah. If you love, you can't love him and not fuck with her. Yeah. Absolutely. So don't even fucking come around me with that shit. Exactly. Like that, man. And I ain't even been in no fucking real shit this year, but my mother asked me some sideways shit one time about, uh, like, yeah, I'm gonna run home, kid, and like, just like squeezing in like 30 minutes of fatherhood in the midst of chaos. But wouldn't you just see him in the morning? Oh, shit, you got to go. You don't even understand the dedication that's happening here. Yeah. Mm. You're assessing my schedule? When it comes to him, yeah, no, I'm sorry. We, there's it's it's eleven. I don't want to keep you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can, we can, yeah. What what else? What uh, else? I'm sorry. No, no, no. no I love there. this. Is what I, I this is what I I, I really. I, uh, I am curious just because you're an ambitious guy. How did you? I always think to myself, I love kids, I love kids, no doubt. But I, the idea of putting someone ahead of my self, is really tough to. Uh, Wrap yeah, my head around. It's tough. It's tough. There's days that you have to balance. Did you know before you had a kid, did you go, I'm ready for this? Fuck no. No? Fuck no. It was it, it was one of those things where you have the kid, though. And I'll say this. I would not be where I am career-wise in the last seven years if I did not have a child. Yeah. Having a child. I've heard that. Opens up a fucking partition in your hustle that you just didn't even know was there. And I say that, you know, with regards to women as well, I think the difference might be a man's impulse to remain present versus going out and providing. You know, I I had a conversation with 
I had a conversation with someone a couple of weeks ago just about the concept of male paternity leave. And so she was saying that the problem is that it's called maternity leave and not parental leave because women's parental, women's maternity rights and being able to be off months and months to care for a newborn and your job not tripping on that shit or trying to fire you or diminish you during that time, women will only get rights in child care when men start fighting for the same rights, which means a man has to detach from the hustle, that hustle impulse that makes him get right back. I gotta go, gotta get right back to it. Mm -hmm. I gotta get out there and fucking provide. But like that, so when my son was born, I did not take maternity leave. And so the debate was, you know, it just, it was a mild debate, but just, you know, was that the right thing to do? You're setting a bad example for the women in the office who will then feel like they need to come back really fast from when they have a kid because your men set the bar for office expectations, which I understood. But at the time, my son was born in the middle of Trump, and I was still in my first year at The Daily Show. So, mm. you know, as talent, I was like, this is the time. I can't take yeah. two months off during a Trump primary because I need to shine so I can get another fucking contract. Yeah. So I can keep providing. My son was born. I was probably, you know, I probably took two weeks. I was back to it. And then I was still the weekends. I canceled like road gigs and I would go back because they, they weren't even living in New York with me yet because I was like, I might get fired. Sure. Right. Don't fucking come to New York. Stay the fuck out there. And when I feel like it's solid and I feel like I'm not going to get fired, then we'll do the full New York family fucking thing. But like that impulse to just fucking go get it and attack and attack and attack and attack. I wouldn't, if I had a kid, I wouldn't have been doing that. Now, of course, you have to have balance, but I think the balance to a degree. It gives you, it forces you to just exist in the world. A child, for, as a comedian, a child forces you to have periods of your life where you just exist and you're not completely plugged into your career. And then that shit becomes fertilizer for your creativity down the road. Maybe not now, but in a year or two or another year or two, you know, there, there's a lot of lessons that you get from just being with your child life lessons and stuff. Um, this one I'll tell you off air, but like just, I've learned so much just building Legos with my son and how, so I have all of these scripts that I've, that I've sold over the last couple of years for various TV shows. And I get partnered with various people and some are good creative partners and some are <clears> fucking <throat> terrible, They're fucking terrible. <laughs> and, it all just comes down to fucking Legos. Like the idea of like where I feel like I'm weak. I feel like I'm not a, I feel like I'm not a good leader. Like that's been the thing that I've been trying to work on this year mm. is that once you get beyond just being funny and you're talking about having a show and having a staff and being in charge of people, you have to be a motivator. You have to fucking, be a emotional triage. You have to understand what, and you only learn that from parenting because kids make, make you play guess the emotion. I've been doing that for four or five years and now he's finally old enough to communicate what's wrong or what's going on or I have to figure out a way to get him to open up. But like with Legos, if you ever build Legos with children, it's essentially, to me, it's a perfect allegory for leadership in that the child understands that you're in charge and you're giving the child agency to build and look at everything or whatever. And when there's instructions, my son and I can build, he's six, so we can build Lego Technics, which were for like 12 year olds, you know, and outside of like a little bit of just dexterity because some of the pieces are just too small yeah. mm -hmm. for his fingers. We crank that bitch out in an hour and a half. Like, it's three-hour build, but the both of us together looking at the instructions and putting this shit together, crank it out, no problem. Same child, and you put us in his room 
And it's just, hey, we're going to build something. Where are we going to build? I don't know. Let's just build. And we pour all the pieces onto the ground. And we just start putting shit together. Now he's reaching over and he's fucking with my pieces. He's got a piece that I really need. So now I'm trying to trade a piece to get the piece that he needs. But he doesn't want to do that. And I'm like building what I want to build. And he's going, I have a way to improve that. But that's not what the fuck I want it to fucking do. And now I'm looking at your thing and bro, if you would just move the door this way, then you wouldn't need that piece. You're creating a dynamic where you need a very odd piece. But if you move it this way, you get an even piece. It's more even. That's mine. I want to. When there's no clear direction, no one follows. Mm. And so from my child, I learned that as a leader, it's my job to give a clear mission directive or a clear this is what we're accomplishing. This is what we're here to accomplish. These are the ways that I believe we're going to do it. Now, who's going to do these things? It's not, well, what are we doing? What are we doing? I don't know, what, you know. Like, it's no different than having a script outline before you start writing a script mm-hmm. versus just writing off the dome. And if you have someone that you're, you have a writing partner that you're writing with, you have a script outline. Well, then that motherfucker can go write act two while you write act one. And then you come together and those two pieces are going to interlock perfectly. Because that's what we do with the Legos. Mm -hmm. I tear the fucking bitch in half. Tear the instructions in half. Yeah, you do these pages, I do these pages, and fucking see how it connects. And it connects perfectly every time because there was instructions. There was something clear in there. And that is part of whatever is next for me is going to involve being a good fucking leader. I did morning radio for 12 years. I was not a good leader. I was a good radio host. I was a good comedian. But when it came to the actual office politics, being a leader of people, I was not good. Do you think being a leader can make you less funny? Because if you're a leader, yeah, you, you have to keep things in line. You have to keep people focused on the goal and is 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 not the great comedian <laughs> the one in the back of the room going this leader fucking sucks because comedy is against the rules yeah and the leader's job is to set the structure i'll agree with that i mean as a parent you are a leader so that's like the first that's the first step but yeah you have to set up the structure for how things are going to get done so you definitely go from left brain to right brain yeah a little bit like and it's it's not fun but then it's like okay well do i want to run something or do i want to be a part of somebody else's thing Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you want to run your thing then you got to fucking have people skills you got to be able to communicate you got to be clear yeah and how you communicate with people and that's probably one of the skill sets that i for sure when when the fuck would i go work on that without a child sure Mm -hmm. and i had to learn that just by happenstance because we just did Legos for years and then one day I looked up and fucking having some issues with this project I was working on I'm like oh shit this is like Legos I didn't give them no instructions no wonder they don't know what the fuck to do that's why everybody arguing get everybody on the zoom call all right motherfucker you do page 12 through 14 you do page 15 through 20 (laughs) and that's it that's what you do don't worry about what they're doing on page 12 your job is page 15 so that I don't know. It helped. It yeah. definitely helped. Um, you figure out. You figure out the moments. I'm not going to sit here and act like fucking parenting. It's like this always beautiful thing. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't mean you don't love your child. It's just yeah. it's stressful. The stress of providing. Yeah, that's not a good stress. But it's necessary if you don't want to be the guy that has to bring his child backstage. And make the feature act babysit him because a couple things went wrong because you didn't focus when you had the chance. You know, I think I think a lot of comedians think that that their window is going to stay open. Your window closes. So I operate with that that paranoia to a degree. Which is good for both. That was the good seeing that George Carlin documentary. You're like, God damn, he had low points after the big high point. (laughs) <laughs> you're just like oh what the fuck yeah yeah so you know i i don't know man i just feel like having a kid it for sure helped more than it hindered mm. 
you're never gonna you're again this career you're always running in fog you don't know what the fuck you, you kind of you know where the next base is but you can't see the whole thing. you ever seen baseball played in fog where it's just like just like like football even in a fucking snowstorm you know the end zone's down there somewhere but just yeah i can see a little bit in front of me so i'll just worry about this and so you just get varying degrees of fog density throughout your career and so a kid can add some but you just it it makes you more adept to navigating the unknown um well as we go to the end we like to do one uh you, know, you better count your blessing you better count your blessing grateful for uh to, to round this out I'll, I'll i'll start it off i went to this uh, lcd sound system concert last night mm -hmm. with russell not i'm not a concert guy not a concert guy. uh but i got uh, perfectly stoned and perfectly drunk mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> it was like the perfect amount of crowded and uh i've listened to a lot of lcd and i i i it's it's not my jam per se mm -hmm. but you add the lights mm -hmm. and, and and the stone yeah the lights and the stone mm -hmm. and i'm i'm in yeah. And then we got home, we played some without the lights. I said, nope, I need the <laughs> lights. I need I the need lights to make so this work. so loud. <laughs> and it was so, uh, uh, you know, I was, I was glad you invited us and oh, let yeah. us into kind of your world. Yeah, yeah. I was glad, too, that you, 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 you did it. Um, my blessing. Um, I, I, I'm doing this new show. and Titanic. Uh, Titanic. Off Broadway. And um, uh, we get to do... Um, Seth Myers this past week and um, I got just lovely notes from from people I haven't spoken to in a long time that you yeah. kind of forget and then you're like just really thoughtful nice notes that I've been reading from people all week that have been a nice little I you know you, you don't know who's seeing these things and it's just nice to to get those um, but yeah yeah um, do you have any blessing you want to share with us um I'm thankful for the Daily Show. It was a good run for Trevor Noah. Yeah, you yeah. Know, it, it it really it really was. It was dope to be included, for him to include me and all of that. You know, just in terms of what that show means to a lot of people, but then also to be able to live in New York and pay my fucking New York rent. Because of that show, I'm also very fortunate because I have aged out of a lot of the college shows. <laughs> I might need to go learn a pogo stick at some point <laughs> to fucking perform. Um, I can see going to college just talking about the importance of having kids to 18-year-olds. I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck is this? They would walk immediately. I'd pull out that bag of candy, Fung Brother style. <laughs> Immediately, <laughs> you, you're so cynical at this point. You just go up there, and just start throwing. I don't need the mic. They just want candy. They want like those big lemon heads, like fucking bullets, <laughs> you can sling them. Um, no, no, the this this. I'm blessed to still be working, man. You know, and I'm thankful for that. You know, there's a lot of upheaval. I'll just leave it at that in the comedy community over the last year and a half. And to be able to still be working and be able to at least still feel like I got my head on straight and fucking be able to pay my bills, like, that's that's a huge fucking blessing. A huge blessing. It's not something I take for granted. So I try to wake up every day and bust my ass and keep that train moving. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is going to come out December 13th. Is there anything you'd like to plug? Um, I got nothing to plug, man. You know, um... I'm getting back on stage slowly. I took last year kind of off from the road and been kind of a ghost in New York too. Cause yeah, just, no, I haven't seen you around. I, I, I'm switching from talking about the world to talking about myself, and I've got to sit down and really excavate what about myself I actually want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Like first, I need to talk about the, the, what what can I talk about about me that I've already worked through in therapy? Let's start with those bits. Sure. So that I'm not on stage unpacking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, I don't know if you've ever seen a comic unpacking for real on stage. That shit is 
awkward. But that's what's weird. Funny. Sometimes you talk about yourself and you're talking about revelations you had five years ago, but now you can talk about them with clarity. Yes. And so in a way, I sometimes think of jokes like, you know how you're seeing, you're not seeing where stars are at right now. You're seeing the light. Uh, having traveled <laughs> that a, yeah. a comedian's comedy is like that you're not seeing who they are now you're seeing like four years ago yeah what yeah. they've discovered fuck that's great yeah um well that's great well uh, uh yeah go see roy wherever you are and russell your show yes it uh well uh, technically if it's december 13th it's opening tonight we've been in previews it's opening eight shows a week uh, at the Dale Roth Theater, um, and also uh, upcoming Uncle Function um, this week, this weekend, December 17th, uh, Saturday, December 17th at Asylum. I have a quick question for you. Please. Voice maintenance. What's your fucking routine? Eight shows a week <coughs> ain't no punk shit. Man. No. Um, I've been doing just like some in the morning honey and tea, um, and then uh, but I've been extra vitamin C, but I've I've not... He was a singing major too. I, I so did go to school for for singing, so, so um, muscles already there. But it's but it's like it is. There's like singing and there's screaming. So it's like uh, I'm early on. We've only been doing it for like two two ish two three weeks now. Mm -hmm. um, so so far good, but. Um, yeah, it, I, I, it this does is why make me nervous. I quit being a singer. I went to college for musical theater and singing maintenance. And I don't think I had like the 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 body for to be a singer but but the maintenance of it was a nightmare is it's a nightmare the 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 people who use the fucking they use they have the thing they all have it a, i might get one because everyone has one they, i think they, it's they, pseudoscience but i know i know but what is it uh, um it's I it's not a, i almost said a humidifier it's not that but it's like you know if you put it yeah. on your, your and then steroids you know like there's there's everyone's oh. time it, it starts with the p everyone does it oh really everyone does Prednisone. it zone yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, Print, and I know that because I lost my voice in 2018. Oh my God, that that performance, that C-SPAN thing. Yeah, you can YouTube that gang. You want to hear me do jokes for exactly 13 minutes with no voice? And did you almost not do it? Like, I mean, it was gone. Your voice was my voice was gone, and I got sent to the Broadway dude. Shout out to Dr. Kessler. He's since retired, so I can say his name now. Um, like, and you go in his office, and it's literally every Hall of Fame. Yeah. Fucking Streisand, fucking Cher, every bro, every Tony. If they've won a Tony, they've been nominated for a Tony. If they've won a Grammy, they've gone to Dr. Kessler at some point. And I just got, to, I didn't know about this fucking guy. And Trevor is like, I have a guy for you. And I'm like, it's eight in the morning. I'm not talking. And he fucking gives me the honey and the tea and some sort of. Vix steam inhaler thing, do this all day, da, da 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 And then he's like, What time is the show? I'm like, Eight o'clock. What time are you on stage? Ten after nine at exactly eight forty seven. Take three of these. At nine oh two, take two of these. That's... At nine oh seven, take this, swallow this, put this lozenge in your mouth. You will have twenty minutes. <laughs> oh my You will God. have twenty minutes. Yo, this motherfucker. Wow, yo, there's there's a whole nother level of medicine out there, and I'm a, cause like that was a sweet fucking lick. I can't miss this check. Yeah, and that motherfucker got me straight. Cause he's like, if you try to press through it, then you fuck it up worse, and then you can't talk for another fucking four months, or three months, or some shit. And he gave me like just all types of, and this is the type of shit that apparently Broadway motherfuckers just every night, ah uh, shit. Can't cancel. Yeah. It's Broadway. The yeah. play will fold if we yeah. miss more than two nights. So, yeah. That, so, I'm, like, trying to never be in that situation yeah. again. So, the preventive maintenance of vocals is something I've become a little bit more. And I've had, like, scratchy incidents since yeah, then. Yeah, of course. But could soldier through them. But that shit, that 2018 C-SPAN, that shit was not yeah. fucking funny, bro. And literally the moment I got off stage, like, thank you, good night. <laughs> Gone. <Jesus. laughs> fucking Cinderella type shit, bro. I had my fucking voice, and then the clock struck 923. <laughs> fucking sure as shit. Yeah. Gone. It's not fair. These Broadway eight performances is too much a it's week too with many. what they give you. It's too many. Yeah. But uh, yeah, back in college, it was like the, it was talked about like steroids were like you know like 
did you hear? They did the thing. Yeah. They got the shot. And then the Julie, everyone talks about Julie Andrews, poor Julie Andrews, because you know what, what happened with Mm-mm, her. No. So she, she, her singing career was stopped because she got nodes. And this was back when the, wow. re- the removal surgery was not very precise. So she couldn't sing after that. Yeah. She career can still, done. she can still do something. Like, you know, kind she can of, still but like, she lost, a, but she like lost a, 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 most and of her like, ability. so it's known like in the singing worlds, it's like, that's the thing you, you get scared of. I'm trying to yell on stage less. I'm trying to get a little more Sam Morell on stage because I like to yell. And then I, if yeah. I do that every night, if I start headlining, doing that two shows, three days yeah. in a row. When I do the when I did the like last night show because we four, two shows Saturday, two shows Sunday, that last thing I have that big scene where I scream and it's just like, you gotta, be careful. You gotta be careful. Russell likes to scream. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I like I watched like those old theater fucking. Like those arenas of like Dice Clay, uh-huh. and like even early Doug Stanhope, where a lot of his shit was screaming. You watch Stanhope now, and he's much more subdued. And I yeah. don't know if that's just alcohol and drugs leveling him out <laughs> over the years, but like a guy like Dice, who just ah, 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 fucking Kevin Hart. This what about Kinnison? Yeah, Russell yeah. has like a Kinnison. Like he can seem to yell in a way where I'm like, oh, that would I would lose my voice in one of those <clears throat> yells. Yeah. Kinnison, you know, yeah, same yeah, Kinnison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> like, but and then the worse the act got, the more he had to just yell throughout <laughs> the whole goddamn thing. <laughs> and singers are like, oh, goes. you yelled from your <laughs> diaphragm. I'm like, I don't know what the fuck that means, man. I'm just <laughs> screaming. <laughs> um, yeah, I got to get with you. I'm gonna learn some of that voice maintenance shit. Yeah. Man. Uh, for Throat me, coat tea ain't shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for me, I'm headlining in Miami December 15th and 16th at the Villain Theater. And then my girlfriend's making us go on a vacation, but then I'll be back in New York <laughs> December 23rd. Uh, and then headlining uh, Comedy Zone Jacksonville. Hey, Duval. Uh, hell yeah. Uh, December 29th, 30th, and 31st New Year's. Hello, Fred, if you're listening. Uh, I, I doubt it, but... But I'll send this clip just this <laughs> to him. Um, uh, and I guess Russ and I we're gonna go we're gonna go uh, make some babies now. I feel like I'm convinced. Sure. Um, thank you, Roy. This is hey, thank you, boys. The downside. One, two, three. Downside. You're listening to the downside. The downside with John Marco Cerezi.